Welcome, everybody. Have your undivided attention. The, uh, this is the first event in the London College of Communication Festival of Journalism and Art, in which we are, in different ways, considering the relationship between journalism and art. And we're really fortunate, I'm really pleased to have for the first event Jeremy Della, who needs no introduction from me whatsoever, Turner Prize winning artist. Simply to say, I suppose he's recently added to his amazing CV with the um, We Are Here commemoration of the Somme for two or three weeks ago, which I'm sure people have either seen at first hand or read about or seen on the television. Richard, would you mind shutting the door, please? Thank you. Um, so, welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. So, I mean, on the screen behind us, we've got your piece, History of the World, which I saw years ago at the Haywood, and I really liked it because it seemed to me a kind of journalistic thing. It's telling a story about the world in a way one might, as a written journalist, you might write a piece drawing these uh, links and telling a story about culture. It, do you think of it as a kind of journalistic exercise? It's not a journalistic exercise as such. It's, um, it's a... It's what's called a mind map, as I'm sure you're aware, and it's a way of trying to justify an idea I had for a brass band to play acid house music, which on the face of it is a very humorous kitsch exercise, but I knew it had more depth than that. I, I felt it did, and this, this mind map basically appeared in my mind as soon as I thought of the idea for this thing to happen, and it's a way of connecting all disparate elements of culture and history together, and it's really about how music cannot be separated from history is a part of history and folk music especially and what's folk music now what was it then and the influence of industry and technology on music and uh, you know you could write a 10,000 word essay or you could just do that and I felt that actually was for me would have been a much clearer way of just of, uh, of making a point but it also rescued a, a, an art project from being just a sort of humorous kitsch uh, event which it was as well so it, it, it worked for me in a number of ways. So in a sense, it's a kind of more efficient way of doing journalism. It, you could call it that, maybe, mm -hmm. yes. And it's, a, it's easier to read, and you go on little journeys with it, and you can read it in different ways. There's no li it's not a linear read in a way that maybe mm. a, piece of journal a, a traditional piece of journal journalism is. You can take different routes, and you don't have to agree with it either. It's a very subjective, and it's called, I mean, it's the fact that I called it the history of the world suggests that I was joking in a mm -hmm. sense, but it's the history of some people's worlds that's, you know, that's their, that's it. That's what their world consists of, this diagram. In some ways. So, 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 so what's its relationship to the actual project where you made the music with the brass band? Was it a kind of justification of it or an explanation it's of a, it? It's, it's, a, it's rescue. It's a, a justification but also, and explanation, but it's rescuing it. From just in what being, sense? Well, just from being like, you know, there's a lot of crossover music projects where you get a string quartet to play heavy metal or you get an organist to play this or whatever. And, it, you know, obviously music is translate, has a translatable, is translatable and cover versions are very valid things. Mm. But this gave it a dimension that it, that it wasn't just about two musical styles colliding with each other. So that, uh, and that's what for the benefit of people who might see the project or for your own benefits or for funders or... Well, no, it's, it's for me to justify it as an artwork rather than just a music project. And also it's for the public to understand why I thought it was important to do mm. it and why actually, even though it's funny, there's a lot of things on that diagram that aren't very funny and that are actually very important to people. Because mm. one of the things that crops up on there is the miners' strike, which yeah. uh, and upstairs as part of our show, we're showing Battle for All Grief. Yes. Um, which I think we've probably got. Well, the next slide, I think. That's actually it hap that's, oh, uh, that's, that's, the that's acid form, brass happening. It? So that's, that's it in action. So it works as a diagram, but also I feel it works as a, an event as well. But yes, the, the miners' strike, obviously, for anyone growing up in Britain in the, in the mid-80s of a certain age, or any age, really, I don't know how old you are, but uh, I won't ask, but uh, I'm sure you may remember it. As I remember I it very well, yeah. Yes, and it was something, it was a defining moment. It was uh, a moment of uh, national calamity, basically, and, you know, we're going through one now, but this was a, a year-long sort of disaster for Britain, in a sense, in the way it's just divided the country. And, and, and was that what drew you to it as a subject? Well, I'd, lived, I'd, 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 I'd observed it and lived through it, but in a very, in, in a very cosseted way through watching TV. I was 17, 18 at the time. So, but it's something that had a real effect on me. And especially the, the confrontation at Algrieve was something that really bothered me, even as a young person. 
because it just looked so wrong and, and alien in terms of what was happening. You never thought you'd see those scenes in, in your own country. You thought it would be something that would happen elsewhere. So it stuck with me. Are people kind of familiar with Orgreave and what happens with the sort of history of the miners' strike? And Orgreave was a kind of pivotal moment in the miners' strike, and it was an enormous conflict between involving about 15,000 people. 15,000 people. It was a kind of set piece battle, basically. Yeah, between, between the police and the miners. Yeah. Uh, it took place in a field and overran into a village. And it was kind of the moment where the, the conflict turned in favour of the Thatcher government, I think. Really, basically, wasn't it, in, because in many it was such ways. a public humiliation of the miners. They were thoroughly beaten on that day and uh, they were chased, effectively chased by men on horseback, but also there's all these different sort of police units and dogs and so on. It was a rout. It wasn't really a battle, really. Mm. And it changed tactics of the, the miners, but also it gave the government what appeared to be a propaganda victory. So that was a very important part, and we'll probably talk about that. So this is a photograph from the, the event as it was in June 84. I saw it as a young person, and then in, if I, I, I just might as well just say, yeah. and, you know, in, and I saw that, something like 98, Artangel were asking people to come up with ideas for projects, you know, self-commissioned works, effectively. And uh, it's called an open submission. And I, I submitted the idea to reenact this in, in the place at you know, in real time with 15,000 people, which didn't actually happen in the end, but we got, we had a thousand, but, and we didn't do it in real time, but it was the idea of just going back to a moment in history and re-examining it through performance, through art. But, but, but the people who reenacted it, some of them were actually, had been involved in the original conflict. They were yeah, I mean, this miners is, or former miners. Exactly, so this is, this is a still from the day. This is the second half through the village, which was much more chaotic. We you know, we'd scripted it the first half, the second half was very chaotic um, because it all the scripts sort of went to pieces, and so it was great basically. And uh, and this is it. And yes, yeah, so we recruited from uh, miners who'd been part of it because if you didn't get their agreement, there's no point doing it really. So the, the research process was at least a year, telling people what was going to be happening or asking them, then sort of telling them, getting their agreement and their understanding of it. So it's local men who've been part of it. Uh, and then it was uh, reenactors, people who are part of reenactment societies, because we knew we could recruit large numbers of those people. They're quite easy to find. And uh, so we had about 1,000 in the end, maybe a little bit less. So, so you're, you're, you're doing this in sort of 97, like about 15 years, 14, 15 years after the... Yes. So you're, you're kind of looking back at something with the benefit of some history in hindsight. Was there, was there a kind of feeling that it had been kind of neglected and forgotten and you yes. wanted to bring it back to people's attention? Well, I mean, it was, ne it was neglected. This is the height of New Labour. It's pre-9-11. So people weren't... It was good times. I mean, that's how people maybe felt about Britain. The local council was Lib Dem and they didn't want to have anything to do with it whatsoever. They just wanted to say that. They actually said to us, this is the past, we're, we're about the future of Sheffield, the future of South Yorkshire. And uh, so we, we had no assistance, which was in a way really good. No education programme, no one wanted to touch it. <laughs> you know, now you'd have to have a huge education programme around anything like this. It's just like no one was interested. The police were not very happy about it, but they, there's nothing they could do to stop it because we build it as a film shoot because we made a film at the same time. And once you just talk about, oh, we're making a film, it, it opens doors. If you're saying we're making a piece of political performance art, you're like, oh, no, actually, <laughs> that's not going to happen. But it's a film. People understand that language, and it's vaguely glamorous as well. So some people, even the reenactors, thought it was a film shoot, effectively, even though they knew I was an artist. And, and, and you mentioned the research you did in advance of this, which was actually really substantial, I think. It was a year or 18 months yes, of research. Yes, I mean, research. the research was basically reading, but actually it was more or less just one-on-one -on -one meetings with people in their houses or pubs or cafes and just getting the word out through individuals who would then tell their mates, oh, this guy's all right, this, could, this is going to be okay. And so, you know, you started meeting one, two people, and then you got to bigger groups, and by the end, you know, like... Month, a few months before, you're in a room with 100 former miners, and they will be, you know, they will question you about why you're doing it. And often, the guys that would be questioning you would, would end up in the film as the best people, or mm. you know, they're the ones who wanted to know why, it, what, what is this. And so, there was still a residual suspicion of the media and of journalism and of TV as well. The fact that Channel 4 paid for it was good because Channel 4 were mo 
probably the most sympathetic news outlet at the time to the strike. And um, it was actually very easy. They totally got it. The guys got it, uh, the former miners. The reenactors didn't quite understand what they, they were doing in a way, some of them. But that was fine. I was more concerned for the miners. And you, and you talked about the, the, the media coverage at the time was very, very controversial. I mean, there was the usual, probably expected stuff from the Mail and the Sun, but there was, mm. a, there was quite a, a, a big episode involving the BBC and the reversal of some film. Well, it's very famous. This is a very famous moment uh, in, in the strike where some film was reversed. It's a very simple trick. It must be the oldest trick in the book. Um, uh, whereby it looked, they just edited it to look like the miners had provoked the police charge, where in actual fact the police had charged and then the miners had thrown stones at them to keep, just to keep this, try and keep this distance between them mm. and the police. But it looked like actually the miners were throwing stuff first and then the police went in. Um, and that's a very, you know, it's a classic trick of editing, isn't it? Mm. And, and, uh, and, and the BBC later kind of acknowledged they'd done this and said it was a mistake and yes. so on and so forth. It took, a, yeah. took some years, I think, for the BBC to acknowledge that, mm. but it was, it was a mistake in the edit. But I mean, there's conspiracy theories abound mm. around that and around the strike, which is why there's meant to be, you know, there's a big call for a, a uh, public inquiry into the policing at this event, as, as I will call it, uh, of the Battle of Orgreave, but maybe the whole strike. Uh, and maybe now we have a new Prime Minister who's Home Secretary, it might even happen, yeah. who knows? Uh, 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 there, was, there was an interview I saw recently with the BBC industrial correspondent at the time and he said basically there were, the feeling was so strong about this whole episode and the miners' strike and the desire for the, from, from the part of the government to see the miners go back to work and he said that I, as industrial correspondent at the BBC, was effectively a mouthpiece of the establishment and he was kind of repenting quite publicly of the coverage that even the BBC gave um, it's, at the yeah, time. Yeah, I'm sure, I mean, there's always rumours about sort of MI5 agents being within the BBC, making sure things are done, and mm -hmm. who knows? We, we haven't got to the bottom of it by any means, but there were provocateurs amongst the miners who were doing things. Mm. Uh, that's almost well known now. So th did you see your project as a kind of corrective to that media coverage? In a way, that's how I presented it. I presented it as something that would be different from anything that happened before. Uh, it would be told from their perspective. It wasn't going to be trying to be fair or tell the truth. It was going to be said, it was going to tell their version. It was unapologetic about that. I never, in the end, we did have a policeman speaking in the film, uh, but it was pretty told from their perspective, mm -hmm. and there was no problem with I had no problem with that. Um, I saw it as a public inquiry, really. But a sort of a, 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 as a piece of performance art, or as a performance, a performative public inquiry, or a, the other way I call it is a sort of crime scene reenactment. You know, these things happen when there's horrible murders and kids are abducted and so on. They will they will reenact what the lead up to something or the aftermath of something. And I felt it was it was that, but with a thousand people. But the, the process you went through of research was a very journalistic process, actually, where you went and mm. interviewed people and read the documents, and yeah. it seemed quite a kind of open-minded process of inquiry, not, not, not one that started from a kind of particular perspective. No, I mean, I, you, you, you had your views and your sympathies, but yeah. it felt as if you were kind of going into the subject and finding out as much as you could in order to tell the story. I was totally trying to find out what happened that day, because it was still bothering me from being a teenager. So I, I was totally trying to work out in my mind what, what had led up to this situation, what it was like on the day and what happened afterwards. So yes, I had a, I had a very clear point in mind to, to find out for myself personally what, it, what was that all about, that thing I saw on telly. And uh, I think I got relatively close. I mean, I got hold of things that were used in the trial because 93 men were arrested and they were going to go on trial for riot and these really ancient crimes they were charged with but could have been spent a long time in prison and the trial fell apart because the police had made false statements and unfortunately for them they'd filmed the whole battle from behind the police lines and so they had it was very clear what was happening at what times and what was being said because they had a, a clock on the camera and uh, and so the fact that they filmed it and then they what they said in court was contradicting filmed evidence meant that the case fell through very, very quickly. And uh, I got hold of that footage, but also I got hold of um, the transcript of, of the film and also lots of other things from a lawyer, which was really great.
Because mm. it felt like that, that process you went through, it's, it's the same process somebody might go through if they're going to write a book or make a documentary yeah. film, but you chose to present it in this particular format. It, 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 do, do you think that you know, art enables you to tell these stories in a way that journalism can't, or does it, does it give you opportunities that journalists don't have, or well, I mean, is, it, is it just the way you choose to do things? I mean, I did, you know, we did a film and we did a book, which I was very happy mm -hmm. about, but also we did an artwork. And of course, a journalist can make a film and a book, but a journalist wouldn't be able to do a thousand person reconstruction. And that's maybe where art can do, can reach the parts, as you say, that other, uh, other sort of practices mm. can't. You can, you have, a f you have a freedom to play around really, and to do things that other people would not be allowed to do, or, wouldn't, or they'd be thought of being mad if they were trying to do it. But you are given free reign, or s what appears to be free reign sometimes when you're very lucky to do things. So, I, I mean, there's other examples of that in my career, but this is obviously the clearest, biggest public mm. example, I would say. And does that give, do you think that gives you an opportunity to tell the story in a better, more effective way, or is it just a different way of telling the same story? I would never say it's better. I think it's a good en entree. In a way, it's a good entry point for the public into the minor strike, or for a young person, or for someone from abroad, is to see a film and see it through that. It's an, e it's an easier sort of mainlining of an argument, mm -hmm. maybe. And uh, it, what's interesting about this film is that it's always somewhere, being shown somewhere in the world. It has a kind of universality to it, which I never expected. And so, for example, at the moment, it's in Spain. It's been in Mexico and Argentina in exhibitions. It's always being borrowed. I don't know if you're showing it here, even. We are showing it you here, yeah. There we yeah. go. So, I mean, it has, has a life beyond that one moment, mm -hmm. and I think a, the story is one that people understand around the world. It's not just about Britain, it's about the force, you know, the state against the, the, the worker or the individual or groups of individuals. Each country has their own version of this, basically, their own story, their own conflict or confrontation that they can relate to it. And, and I get the sense from what you were saying earlier that without the film, the piece wouldn't have happened, but the piece is, isn't is a kind of thing in its own right. The, yeah. the uh, film is not the kind of end point of what you're trying to do. I'm very, very bad at documenting my work. I'm terrible at it. And uh, so I was very happy to have the film made. Basically, Channel 4 were putting money into this open commission programme, and they paid for the film to be made, and that, which meant we paid for the performance to happen, because the two are more or less the same thing. So I, I was very happy. It was a means to an end. But actually, I'm very, very glad a film was made, because it has a longevity to it that images don't really, um, mm. and, and it's really, it's an incredible bit of documentation for me, that's how I see it. Um, also, going back to, you know, we talked about humour, mm. this is, you know, there's humour in this as well, there's a potential for disaster, because it's a, such a kind of Monty Python idea, really, and um, I, I was aware of that, and I like that, I like working with ideas that actually have an absurdity to them, and also could go the wrong way, and that could have easily gone the wrong way, very easily. It was a terrifying day to be there, there, there's, there's, a, there's a moment in the film where you're kind of walking through a field saying, I'm no longer in charge of this. It was true. Mm. Is, 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 that, is that a good moment or a bad moment? It's good if you could take all the credit afterwards if it goes well. <laughs> <laughs> and then if it doesn't go well, you say, well, actually, I wasn't in charge of it. Uh, but it, it, <laughs> it was, um, once you get to the point of doing a film shoot with effectively a thousand extras and all people running around with walkie-talkies and camera crews and whatnot, you can't, I couldn't really direct that. I didn't have the skills to direct it, but I'd, I'd set up the situation and I'd set up the template for what was gonna happen. And I just had to rely on people to behave, and, or not even to behave, not, not to behave, and just do the best they could. But uh, yeah, I'd lost control, really. But I was, I'm interested in that when things go out of, bit out of control. A lot of things I do are in the public realm where you really don't know what's gonna happen from minute to minute, literally. And so uh, that's exciting and you hope that actually makes it better. And I think some of the things, we'll see the stuff from mm. a couple of weeks ago actually was better because it was random and it was, no one really knew how things would pan out really. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but um, a lot of people would struggle with that, I think, the idea that they're no longer in control of the thing that they're making. Uh, you know, people, some, some people don't like kind of chaos and lack of control, but you seem yeah. to be okay with it. I don't mind it up to a point. I mean, it's, if you planned it well enough beforehand, then you just let it go and just, you just say, well, let's see what mm. happens. You just mm. treat, treat it like some sort of huge social experiment yeah. and then just see it like that and just step back and just observe it because mm. you can't get involved. Mm. You just have to let it go. And uh, so that, that um, yeah, some artists would send them crazy. Others, uh, like myself, I'm quite happy for that. And 
Where are we now relative to Orgreave, do you think? Do you think Orgreave still matters, or is it just a historical document? Well, now? I think after, weirdly, I think after Hillsborough, Orgreave is very, is the next one. It's the next scandal. Mm. No one died there, unlike at Hillsborough, but it was definitely a, a sort of scandal in terms of like, police corruption. So it's part of the same story. So, for example, the policeman who's in my film, who helped us with the, with the performance and trained up police, he was also at Hillsborough. Mm. And he had to retire after that because, you know, he sort of had these terrible sort of post-traumatic moments. In, and uh, he's actually in the documentary, the BBC documentary from about two months ago, which is actually mm. a really pretty good documentary, mm. I thought. And so it's the next one, really, and the whole policing of the strike is the next big public truth and reconciliation moment, maybe, that we might have. But it's, if anything, it's going to be more complicated because it was a year long and there were the secret services were involved. Mm. You know this and there's a lot of underhand things, a lot of illegality and criminality involved uh, on a scale that's much bigger than Hillsborough because it went on for, it was every day for a year, basically. Mm. So it could be quite an explosive uh, inquiry if it's done with no holds barred. There's, there's a very strong sense in the film from some of the interviewees and in the book where people talk about as being a kind of a moment of sort of generational change where society could have, could have gone in one direction or another direction. Mm. And I think somebody says it was a kind of winner takes all thing between yeah. Thatcherism and the forces of the, you know, the, the forces of the left or working class solidarity. Do you, do you, do you kind of agree with that analysis? Uh, I, you know, when those big statements are made, I, you just don't know. I mean, if, if the strike had been won by the union or by the striking miners and Thatcher had been deposed, then that, that might have been a huge moment for Britain. Mm. But it's difficult to say. I try, I try and avoid those big moments in terms of what I would say, because you just don't know really. It's all hypothetical. Mm. But it's definitely a fight to the death. Mm. That, was a, that, that was a fight to the death, this battle, this war effectively. Yeah. And when you know, people like me are old enough to remember it, you, you think back to that era of very strong, self-confident unions and you know, nationalised industries. Mm. And seeing that film, reading the book, made me realise how much has changed in those, uh, you know, over well, that period of time, how much society has changed. Well, a lot has changed, and that's probably a good reason to make a film and to do a book, because I think a lot of young, younger people, as I will, don't know really about it so much and probably mm. pr might even be bored of hearing about people banging on about it but they might want to watch a film about it I don't know mm. so it's important to know that's within living memory because yeah. there was a sort of sense it got somewhat written out of history I think you know uh, for something that actually is quite momentous and uh, yeah. in a lot of ways it sort of got forgotten about and we had Billy Elliot I think it sort of turned up in there as the background to that yes. in a very anodyne way yes. but it's not something that kind of features very much in our sort of sense of ourselves or the, the story we tell about not, our not culture. In the, not in the South. I think if you went up to the north of England, mm. it would be a different story. Or into South Wales, it would be a different story. But like I said, you know, when I did that in 2001, uh, it, was, you know, it, was a, it was a moment where the Labour Party didn't want to talk about it, certainly. Mm. And the art world was not interested in it, which is why I like doing it, because it seemed to be going against everything that was happening at that moment. So it probably still needs its great... Um, artwork or a great investigation of the miners' strike. But still have, no one's still made a really great film about it, mm. like feature film. I think it needs that yeah. to really start it again. Weirdly, you need art again or culture mm. to sort of kickstart it again. Mm. Should we talk about it? It is what it is. I think that's Let's coming go up on. Next, isn't it? We're going to shoot forward a few things. There's some reenactors for oh, you. Yeah, there so we go. The actual reenactors. They are the real thing. So the, these are the people who at weekends go and reenact yeah. the Civil War or... Anything from you know, history whatever. from literally 1000 BC to 1945. Mm. And, uh, but very rarely post-war. Mm. They might be doing co the Korean War now, but I haven't seen it. Mm. Uh, and, and it was quite obvious from the film that the, the Orgreave battle felt in some ways like a kind of medi medieval struggle. Yes. And you had cavalry charges, yes. and people beating their shields yeah, and all, all this sort of thing. Yeah, were used by the Romans, actually, mm. were used by the police for the short and long shield formations. I mean, literally, yeah. the same ones. Um, this is Adrian Street and his father. Oh, yes. This is a photo, I'm going to whiz through, actually. This is a photograph taken in 1973. Really, for me, it's a photograph of Britain past and future. Or, or the you know, industry turning into the 
world of entertainment. And he's a, he's a wrestler who's come he's back a, to see his dad in the pit, isn't he? He's he hated, in, in the mine that he worked in that he hated, with the people in the background who he hated, just to show them basically what the future was going to be. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's a science, science mm. fiction hero, like Flash Gordon or something, coming to, to show these sort of industrial peasants, basically, as he mm. saw them, that this is, you know, your life is going to be... This is over. And he was quite a camp flamboyant. Is he still alive? He's, he's still alive. Camp he's still, flamboyant figure. He's a very yeah. camp. He's not camp, but not gay, uh, I should hasten to add. Uh, so he had this gay sort of persona, which he knew he could make money out of. Very cleverly cultivated it, but actually was knew that it was a way to make cash. And, and really tough guy. Tough little <clears> guy. <throat> this is memory bucket. I'll just go through this. This is 2003, the beginning of the war in Iraq. So some souvenirs from George Bush's hometown of Crawford that I just put into an installation. So these are T-shirts to celebrate visits by heads of state and uh, how they view them in these souvenirs. And a memory bucket is a kind of documentary. Would you, would you call it a documentary? It's a sort of documentary, a very scrappy documentary. And, and, like and it brings, brings together Bush and the Waco, Waco, Waco siege. Waco, which was a kind of you know, mili- you know, siege and an attack on a mili- mm. on a, by the military on a on this compound where they thought they were legally had guns and mm. explosives. You know, it's not t- so different from the reasons for going into Iraq, I thought. And, uh, and uh, so it was about the state of mind of Texas and mm. recent history in Texas. This is, it is what it is. This is the uh, suggestion that I had for the fourth plinth, for a car that had been destroyed in Iraq in the conflict to be on the plinth. That's... That's a, bit, that's a very good bit of Photoshop that I didn't do. I feel like you could do. <laughs> but, uh, that didn't happen. But I did take a car around America. I got hold of a car that had been destroyed in a bomb attack in Baghdad and went on a tour of America with it, mm. towed it around and just turned up kind of randomly, really. Again, this idea of randomness uh, at, at uh, towns around America over a period of three weeks with an Iraqi citizen, with the guy sitting down there, and an American soldier. So we covered our bases in terms of discussions and we just talked to the public and the public came up and just chatted to us about the car and their feelings to the, about the war and about their lives, about religion. And we had a very free form, open ended conversation about America at that point, but also its involvement in Iraq. But there, there, there were kind of conversations that probably wouldn't have happened had the car not been there in a kind of odd way. The, no, the, the, the car seemed to kind of give permission to people to talk about things. And you know, there's a term conversation yeah. piece. Yeah, that's true. And it was a kind mm. of conversation piece. It was a way to get people interested. I mean, what was amazing was we took this around a very lot of Republican red states. Mm. You know, we took it to Louisiana, Mississippi, all these places where we thought we'd get attacked, liter- you know, literally attacked mm. for doing this bringing this hideous object into people's daily lives. And we got a few people who were angry with us, but no one had no trouble, really. It was amazing how the American people were actually very interested in it and uh, willing to talk and sort of confront something that, that you know, was more or less their responsibility. Um, and so it was, a, it was a very interesting process. And was your starting point with that that you wanted to kind of tell a story about America or tell a story about the Iraq war? Or how, how, how did it kind of well, fall it, together? Originally, I wanted to do a museum of the war in Iraq when the war was still happening. So it was a museum of the present. And that was going to tour around America and be in museums. All the, sort of, all the detritus, but also all the material that's produced in a war, all the propaganda, mm. all the things that happen. And I'd seen it on a documentary that in a British army base, they'd made a little display of IEDs and what to look for. And I thought that would be really interesting to be shown to Americans all around America. Uh, and because it looked like a, a sort of piece of contemporary art almost, but it was a practical thing. And I thought if you could have that, you'd have a, something destroyed, you'd have all this propaganda that's produced, all these comics that were produced by the American government for Iraqi kids to be, feel proud of their country. And we had some of those. So it was, it was going to be a war about the, uh, sorry, a museum about the war, but it, mm. it, it was very difficult getting material out, weirdly, from there. But we got a car from someone else who'd got a car out. And that was, for me, was enough, especially because the plinth thing hadn't worked out. And I felt, well, this, this is great to tow a car around a country that's based on cars, mm. economies based on cars, and just see what happens. And just, you know, but like I said, from minute to minute, we had no idea quite what the reception would be. Let's see if there's a... 
Oh, the images, mm. oh, there we go, that's in a marine base uh, in California. Mm. So on the side it said this car was destroyed by a bomb in a Baghdad marketplace on March the 5th. It wasn't proselytizing, it wasn't saying impeach George Bush, or it wasn't saying war is bad, or any of that stuff. I mean, I felt it was too late by then to start going on about that. I just wanted to show something from that conflict, some huge, big thing as evidence, basically. So I was taking a piece of evidence around, of, again, a crime scene, effectively. It was a mobile crime scene. The bomb was not in the car. The, bomb was dis the car was destroyed by a bomb, I hasten to add, because the car wouldn't have existed if the bomb had been in it. It was just, you know, a, a collateral damage. But also it's, it's to do with cars and human beings. And the, you, you very rarely see dead bodies on the news. You usually see a car that's mm -hmm. been blown up. You don't see the bodies in the car or whatever. So it was, it was the closest you could get to dragging a body around, really, I felt. Um, but does it start with a kind of sort of political impulse work like this or is it just a kind of let's try something and see what happens because it might be interesting well that's impulse. a good question it's, it's a bit of both really obviously my opinions uh, you, do, you know I have opinions about the war clearly you would, I wouldn't have done it otherwise but uh, it's, it's, it's like experiments it's like what would happen if you did this wouldn't it be interesting to see what would happen if mm. if you reenacted a, a battle from the minor stroke if you took a car around if you did all these things they're all kind of questions that I'm asking myself that I am in a, I'm, uh, unbelievably, I'm in, a, I'm in a position where I can actually do that thing, which is very unusual. Most of us, most people, I might have these thoughts, but will never get close to doing it. But I'm in a very lucky position in that I can. Because, the, I mean, the, the, there, there would be ways of doing, I guess, anti-war art or pro-miners mm. art, which would mm. be kind of quite straightforward and yes. proselytising. And you, you do these quite kind of complicated, research-heavy, somewhat kind of, you know, you don't quite know how it's going to end up exercises. Well, they're not, I mean, I suppose what they're not, uh, they're not like activist art or they're not mm. demo, what I would call demo art, which I love. <coughs> they're not banners. I mean, I do make banners, mm. but they're not banners, they're not placards which are of the moment when you're going on a march or you're, doing, or you're angry about something. This is obviously, it's a longer term thing. It's more considered, I suppose you'd call it, and more complex. And also it's not, uh, it's not um, telling you something, really. We were very clear not to, to be as bland as possible in the way we presented this project. I didn't want it to be alienating to anyone who's pro or anti-war. Mm. As, it, as it happened, the people who were most annoyed with us were anti-war activists because they felt we were not anti-war enough in what we were doing we'd actually let them down mm. by not having like sort of loudspeakers just saying come and see what's happened here you know they yeah. wanted it to be sort of bells and whistles and so do, do you, feel, you feel obliged to a sort of sense of bbc balance here where you're sort of trying to say you know here are some things that have happened have happened you form your own opinions on it i'm not going to tell you what to think i just don't like having my opinions forcing my opinions on people in a traditional way. Mm. I mean, nowadays, because of the position I'm in, I get asked to go on Newsnight quite a lot, and I just couldn't think of anything worse, really, to go on Newsnight and try and make mm. comments about contemporary politics and issues and so on. I'd be just awful at it. So you, you, you weren't asked to go and talk about Brexit on I the was, television? I yeah. was, you? you said no? Yeah, twice I was asked mm. to go on, and I was asked last week to do something. I can't remember what it was now. I actually can't remember what it was. Will Self always goes on instead of me. Mm. Yeah. I mean, literally, mm. twice now he's gone on. There, 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 there are quite a lot of visual artists who do do that, though, aren't there? Yes. Who, who, are, who are very politically there's, engaged there's, in that sense. There's people who wear their heart on their sleeves. I'm not quite as good as them. I mean, the most candid you'll ever get me is now, really. Mm. But I don't... Uh, I, I find it difficult being a spokesperson for something. Is that because you don't have strong opinions or you just don't want to voice them? I do have them, but I don't think they're articulate enough to, to stand up to scrutiny on Question Time, like being asked to do that. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse going on Question Time. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so I, I, always, I think I'm better at this sort of thing mm. than that sort of thing. I'm not a politician. Mm. Uh, and I wouldn't really want to be one. Um, certainly not at the moment. <laughs> um, so that's, this is just people looking at the car through from their cars, which is quite an interesting thing mm. in itself. And now a car is on permanent display at the Imperial War Museum, which is, a, for me, was a, a, a place where it should be anyway. And the display is a little bit about the trip it went across America, but actually it's not, it's actually very uninteresting. 
it should be residing there as, a, as, a, as an artefact of war, basically. But you tried to get it on the plinth. What, 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 what happened with that? Well, I How far know. did you get with I'm that? I'm shortlisted, so I went down to the last six. And uh, I'm on the plinth committee now, so I know what happens. You know, mm. you go... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened with that, but I know what happens with the sort of dis the process. So to get down to the last six is pretty good, I have to say, mm. I, uh, because I know how tough it is, and the competition is huge. It's like a hundred people yeah. who are select asked to anyway. Uh, but apparently, at the selection panel where it wasn't selected, there were like people almost sort of throttling each other, at pro and anti. People were, like standing on chairs and shouting, and apparently it was very, very heated. I've never been told who was pro and who was mm. against. Uh, but some people were absolutely. I mean, it's a hugely irresponsible thing it would have been to put it on the plinth potentially. Why? Well, it could have been a provocation to some people. You just don't know. You don't know how the public will react to So wh wh why did you put it forward if you thought as that? A then? Provocation as a provocation. As a provocation. I mean, when, when Art Angel <laughs> rang me up and said, oh, we want to do that thing, the minor strike, the first thing I thought was, oh, shit, I didn't actually mean it. I just thought, <laughs> I just wanted to see what, if you, how far I could get with this ridiculous idea. And, uh, but of course you want to do it. But a part of you is like, oh no, that means I've got to do it now. And uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, yes, it was a provocation and I was hoping that it would... I wasn't sure whether it was possible to do it on the plinth, but it, it would have been great for it to have gone there, obviously. But actually, the life it had going around America was equally as exciting in a way. And it was less controllable and more dynamic because it was on the move. So does, does the plinth committee steer away from things that are politically controversial, do you think? Not, not really, no, they don't, because I'm on, I'm on it mm. now and I know, but it's a very big committee, so mm. it's difficult to, to influence when there's 12 people, which is probably why they do it as a big committee. Mm. There's only four, you can probably get your way more, but when there's 12, mm. it's more difficult, so you, don't, you, don't, you might not get those extremes. But um, I don't know what, really what the conversations were, but I, people do tell me they were heated, in inverted commas, and... Mm. Uh, which is unusual for the plinth. For the conversations yeah. I've had are usually yeah. quite. There's a lot of agreement. What's on there at the moment? It's the uh, Hans Hacker. I think it might have gone down though. It's the horse with the ticket. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, should we? Should, should we talk about we, um, we are here? Yes. This is just a journalistic exercise in a way. These are drawings made by prisoners who were soldiers about the war in Iraq who served in the Middle East. Tony Blair. Uh, this is a drawing made by a soldier of um, an event when the night before he went off to Afghanistan at Waterloo Barracks in London, a group of soldiers were smoking crack cocaine, and that's the photograph. That's a drawing of, of his memory of it. Um, is this something that you kind of curated? Or? Yes, I curated it. I, I, it was for Venice, the Biennale, and I, wanted mm. to, I knew I wanted to do something around prison art because I'd worked in prisons mm. a little bit. But it had to, couldn't just be like a selection of prison art. It had to be prison art that I'd commissioned. You mm. know, I was commissioned former soldiers to draw their experiences and also to draw men who were involved in the lead up to the war in Iraq. Mm. Uh, all the people we're hearing about now, like Richard Dearlove and Reg Keyes and Rupert Murdoch and mm. all these people. So it was just that, like a portrait gallery, like the National Portrait mm. Gallery mm. of uh, these men. Okay. So this is, how are we doing for time? We've got another, we're doing, all right. we're doing okay. Yeah. yeah, so this is what I did, so the, my last, my latest thing I did, which was, uh, a commission, but uh, two years in the planning, and it's called We're Here Because We Are Here. Um, and it's basically, it was an idea for a commemoration of the Somme. The people who were organising all these cultural <coughs> events around the First World War were really struggling with the Somme. How do you commemorate a disaster? How do you do something that's contempt? Well, that's, uh, that was the first thing. When, I thought, when they asked me about this, I thought, well, it has to be something that's contemporary, something that intervenes in contemporary life, something that isn't a static memorial, which is a, you know, a, co a collection of 20,000 objects, because 20,000 men died that day, more or less, or is one big object, which is the traditional memorial. So I felt it should be a human memorial that had a life of its own and travelled through Britain and had a randomness about it and would go to places where people were not expecting it. And it had a massive impact, I think, you know, amongst people who saw it, lots of people who saw it on the television, people who read about it, yeah, people like my mum yeah. who weren't anywhere near it, but had heard about it. And it kind of, did, did anybody actually see it in real life, as it were? A couple of people. Yeah. It was all over London. But, but, Obviously, but, you were... Not everyone was all over London. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was every... 
It was in about 30 cities. Mm. There was over 1,500 people took part. And basically, they just hung out in public spaces. Uh, they sat around. They walked through towns. And they all were representing a dead man. And they had a business card. A, a specific individual who actually yeah, died in... Exactly. And in they the would world. give out... If anyone went up to them and took their picture or wanted a selfie or whatever, they would give the card to them. Mm. And they would keep that. And, and am I right in saying the, the, the people who were taking part, they, they weren't actors, they were... Some were trainee actors, I would right. say, students. Like that guy might have been a student who looks quite young. Mm. A lot of them were just members of the public. How, how were they recruited? Well, they recruited... It was weird because we had to keep it secret because the effect of it was going to be much more if it was a secret. Mm. That's at Westfield Shopping Centre. Oh, yeah. And uh, so it had to be, they had to recruit, be recruited for something, they didn't know what it was until they were like a week or two in, they would be mm. told what it was and they were told not to tell anyone. And really it was kept more or less a secret. There's a few posts that went up but we were able to take them down. Mm. And uh, it was, you know, it's kind of an infection of daily life, I suppose you'd call it, like a viral thing, but I don't like using that word. An infection is probably better, an intervention. Mm. And... Uh, Yes, so we recruited and then they were trained up over a period of like six weeks. And then they, were at, they went out. They had scripts of where they were going. They had behaviours they were doing. They, could, they didn't speak, <coughs> which was, a, you know, that could have been a big problem, not speaking. Mm. But actually that was one of the most effective things with the public. I mean, we were worried about the public taking the piss out of them and attacking yeah. them or whatever. All these worries we had, but actually the public... The only react, you know, the most common reaction, weirdly, was people crying. I mean, yeah. I wasn't expecting that at all, because I didn't want it to be a sentimental thing. But of course, you can't control the public's reaction to something. But actually, I think it was genuine uh, people being quite upset by it. I think, uh, uh, and it happened kind of coincidentally, right in the yeah. middle of the whole Brexit thing, where, where everybody felt very divided and angry. Yes. Um, do you think that added to its sort of emotional impact? Well, we had, you know, when you planned something two years ago, you had no idea that it will happen literally mm. the week after that event, that uh, referendum, and the, and the, and the, you know, the week after the referendum was almost as worse as the week before, in terms of people willing, clearly willing to sacrifice their country mm. for their own careers or their party or their belief system for their own careers. And then you have this event where all these men are playing young men who sacrifice their lives for their country. It was like a total inverse of what had been mm. going on in public life in Britain for the last two, three weeks. And we didn't, you know, we had no idea that was going to happen. I think that gave it a much bigger edge. Uh, I think, uh, it, well, I know it did because you saw the reaction on social media was huge. And I, I was just interested in the visual, the visuals really initially, and, uh, and the performance language, as I will call it, because now I've been in working with the National Theatre, who worked with me on it. I have all these phrases like performance language, and, and so I was interested in this sort of not so blank expressions, but just people just wa you know wandering around, and and I loved what I wanted them to be in these contemporary environments, so they would find the audience. Like I said, the audience wouldn't go to a, a memorial the memorial would go to the audience just when they least expected it or least wanted it even. And I think I thought that was very important. So shopping centres were a huge thing. This is um, Milton Keynes. And that was very important to go to contemporary environments that wouldn't have existed in 1918 mm. or even 1945 or even 1970. So it was modern Britain, contemporary Britain, with these characters in. And you're right, I think that keeping it secret really kind of added enormously to the impact. If it had been, you know, if we'd known three days oh, yeah, before yeah. this is going to happen at 10 o'clock, so it, it would have been disciplined. It must have been quite hard to do that, though. In well, the it was hard to recruit because no one really knew what yeah. they were doing. Uh, but the secret thing was actually quite straightforward. People really kept it because I think they realised very quickly that if, they, if the secret got out, then it would, be much, it would be much less effective. Their day would be much less effective, be less interesting. Mm. And they just, they got it. But for me, it was really important for it to be a secret because everything now, we know about everything before it happens. Everything. Yeah. You know, you feel, you feel you've seen the, the latest Star Wars film before it's even been shot. And, uh, and everything's trailed, mm. and heavily promoted. And this wasn't, which is, of course, it's counterintuitive. You want people to see it. But we, we went to places where the public were going to be in, ma in great numbers, like railway stations in the morning and so on. So they would hear about it. Also, you know, this, this is not a, a small budget thing. And so you spend all this money and no one knows about it before mm. it happens. And yeah. So there's a lot of, within the organisation 1418 now, you know, mm. that was, they, to their credit, they stuck with it and they, they stuck with me. But, they, you know, they were nervous because they thought, what if no one 
what if no one tweets about this or no one's interested in, you know, we, you know what, what are we going to do? So, um, but actually, it, it didn't work like that. It, thank God, it became quickly very mm. high up on sort of it was, Did you say it was two years in the planning? Well, it, I had the idea two years ago. Mm. And then, you know, these things, you know, they start like that and then they go like this, like that. Mm. And, and so this time last year, it was becoming quite serious. We'd done some tests and we were trying to work out how to do it. And mm. what's great about the theatre, as opposed to the art world, is the theatre is super organised in terms of people and human beings and how to organise them and, and, get, and, and, and move them around. And they're not intimidated by numbers, mm. they're not, you know, because they're part of the film world as well, effectively. So <laughs> it was related to Orgreave in a sense, but much more random. Related in, what, related in the sense of it being not like a re reconstruction. The but production a element of it mm. and returning, people returning to a place because, of course, all these regiments were very much about local areas. You know, they mm. were very proud local. You know, so we were in Northern Ireland, we were in Scotland, we were in Wales. You know, we were in Derry and Belfast, men walking around in British Army uniforms in Derry and Belfast. That hadn't been done for 20 years when the Army left, effectively. Mm. So these things were... It's very important for me to go, to not be afraid to go to places um, in the UK like those and, and, to, and for the men to do it. Um, so that's, that, that was really important. But just the whole organisational aspect of it. Mm. Um, what they weren't doing and what we avoided, was really important to avoid, was they weren't going to churches, they weren't going to war memorials, they weren't going to castles or, or places that you'd expect to see soldiers because what they weren't were like sad soldiers telling a story about how unfortunate it was they were killed. Mm. They were just giving out a card which says their name, their regiment, uh, their death, the day they died, which is the same day, because they all died on the same day, and their age, where we've had mm. it. So it was just it was like a little tombstone, effectively, but it was, they weren't acting. That was, well, that, which is quite difficult to tell young actors not to act. Mm. You know, it's actually massively counter. And did, did they not speak at all? Was they that part of the deal? Word, and they right. sang a song a few times mm -hmm. in the day, which is to the tune of Old Lang Syne, and the mm. words are, we're here because we're here, because we're here, because we're here, we're here because we're here, because, mm. which was a song that was sung when they were on the move. And it, to me, it was perfect. Mm. So it wasn't explaining anything at mm. all. Mm. And it was, seemed to be absolutely like the madness and circularity of warfare and of, of men going off to fight again and again and again. It's a little bit like the phrase, it is what it is, isn't well, it? Exactly. Which is, which is your, your, your earlier piece. Yes, yeah. which is a military phrase as well. Mm. Uh, it's when something goes really badly wrong, you just say, well, that's, that's what happens. Mm. And it's a similar thing. Yeah. So. Should we have some questions? We've got in the last few minutes. Anybody, anybody got a question? Peering over the mics. Question from somebody? There's somebody at the back of that. There's one there. Oh, lady at the back. All oh, right. Do you feel guilty about making money out of other people's sacrifice and torture and torment? How do you feel as an artist? Where you go into the minor communities and obviously they've been subjected to all of this trauma and it still is there, and yet you're making a huge reputation out of. It's a good question. This. I mean, it's like, it's like anything, it's like a journalist doing it or a. TV company or any other artist or creative person, if you, if, if you feel guilty about it, then you'll never make, then no work would be made about it, no films would be made about it, no, nothing would happen. You'd, be, you'd just leave it alone. And uh, so I do think about it, but you don't actually make much money out of it, that's the other thing. You kind of, you couldn't, you know, for all grief, two years' work, 10,000 quid, it was going to be 5,000. So. But yes, I mean, you think, well, I'm doing something out of a situation. But of course, art will go to points of stress and tension, regardless. And uh, that will happen. But I don't feel guilty, no. But I understand your question. And do people ever accuse you of that? No. I accuse Pop myself of Pop it. Apart from Karen. <laughs> weirdly, <laughs> weirdly, I accuse myself of it. It's like, God, you did really well out of the minor strike. <laughs> you know, and you yeah. think, well, why, why did you do... And anyway, but anyway, I think these things are better when they're made than they're not made, and the stories mm. are told, or whatever you want to say, or it's made aware, people are made aware of this thing when they're not made aware of it. Okay. Another question. You said, um, most of your work is doing inquiries. Do you end up getting asked to do stuff that you did you hear that question at the back? Yeah. I did, um, you learn a lot, obviously, from d 
doing certain things. Like I learned a lot about the war in Iraq just by being with an Iraqi for a couple of months. That was an amazing experience, just to hear about his personal experience living in Iraq in the 80s and 90s and then the war, the invasion and so on. Mm. You never get the... Uh, often the questions are so broad that you'll never get an answer as such, but you, get, you might get closer to some sort of understanding. And you only really get it from meeting people who are involved in these things. You don't really get it from... I hate to say it, you, you get your background from books and newspapers and so on, but I, uh, when you meet a person that's done something, then it just you learn so much more. Another question. Yeah, I was going to say, um, there's this idea of post-truth politics so, um, and also on social media. Things that have an emotional impact rather than necessarily a factual one, so they yeah. do very well. Um, so it seems like the kind of fiction is a very powerful place to be. Is yeah. that something you're aware of more generally, that actually, that in the way you are producing these new methods of doing training? I haven't, I mean, I've, I know the, I know, I've heard of the sort of phrase post-truth. And uh, I suppose I am dabbling in it or part of it. Um, I don't know what, what the other examples be in, in terms of sort of classic examples of post-truth. Sort of Donald um, Trump's always cited. Oh, as well, that, I mean lying. Something. You mean <laughs> like, well, exactly <laughs> lying <laughs> and, and, and kind of kind of asserting things, and it doesn't seem to matter that you lie. <laughs> Yes, I, I, maybe it is, and maybe it's more approachable for the public. You know, the idea is, I think the idea from the minor strike one especially was quite an arresting, strange idea, and I think people react to that, and they, they go in through the idea of reenactment of a riot, the kind of contradictory nature of it. But, um, I mean, going on, I think the... I think the, the media, well, clearly with the referendum, did a terrible job. And also with the war in Iraq, they probably did a terrible job as well in, in holding people to account. Um, so maybe there are other ways of doing things, but I wouldn't want this to happen all the time. I think that you, know, you do want more traditional forms, I, I would argue. So do you think in a few years' time you might make a piece of work inspired by the referendum and Brexit and the... Well, I think it could take more than a few years, isn't it? Because it's going to go on for a long yeah, time. But I, hopefully not. I, I, I really wouldn't. I don't know. You, you just don't know, do you, really, mm. what, what's next, what's going to happen. But uh, it's fascinating to be living in it. I wish I, pro you know, I wish I wasn't, in a way, but it's, it's interesting to just see every day. There's just, someone called it death by news, didn't they? Mm. I think it was Edgar Wright had this phrase, which is mm. actually quite a good one. Um, mm. Time for one more question, because J Jeremy has to get away very promptly at 3.30. I can take, mm. I can go a little bit after 3.30. Okay, mm, more questions? Um, I was just interested in what your, what your thoughts on and your feelings towards galleries are. Because you seem quite, you're escaping <coughs> gallery quite a lot. Do you mean, when you say gallery, do you mean museums, or do you mean commercial galleries? Um, yeah, museums. Right. I, well, I mean, I, I exhibit in them. Yeah. Uh, I do. W I work in them uh, quite a lot, and, and you know, I've brought up in museums more or less. That's how it felt. So, I'm very happy to work with national institutions, and when I do, it's very exciting. But uh, there's things you can't do in those places, clearly, and so things like this are, in a way, much more exciting because there's a lot, they're less controllable and they're more. I keep using the word random, but that's, that's probably not the best word to use, but there's, a, there's a, something more vital about them because they're out in the public realm and, then, and they're less controllable. And, but um, I'm probably at my worst as an artist when I try and do commercial art exhibitions, which is in like, commercial art galleries. I just don't know how to do them, and, and they're, they're usually sort of disasters. But um, this is where I like to be doing things like this, big-ish projects, um, but I love museums and I love the culture of museums, so I'm very supportive of that and I love working with institutions, um, even though they can be quite frustrating institutions because people become institutionalised and so you don't get your way in the way that you might want. Um, but uh, I have nothing against you know, national institutions, museums. Another question? Thank you. Um, I, I love the idea of kind of ghosts of history existing like in our in our space and mm. in our time, and I 
I know it's from the work that we've seen today that it's largely a uh, male experience that you're portraying. Yes, and I wondered if that's something that you did on purpose or considered. Or I think if I'm, if you're, this is something that I've, again, another question I've been, are you a journalism student? No. I'm going to say, they ask some of the good, <laughs> difficult questions, but uh, they, I think it's interesting. I suppose I'm, if you're drawn to conflict, as I clearly am with those three, you know, with the war in Iraq, with minor strike, and then this, this war, it's weird, I'm sort of a war artist in a strange way, that that's mainly men, unfortunately. Uh, and so that is, uh, that's almost an inevitable part of it. Um, I do work with groups that aren't exclusively male, but it, I know it doesn't look like it today. But if you're working in the field of conflict or warfare, then it will be almost exclusively male. Having said that, with the Battle of Walgreave, there were women involved and were part of the reenactment. Not many, but there were women involved. But yes, it is a quite male world, and even the brass band world initially was just an all-male band. It, didn't, it wouldn't take female members, but now it does. Um, so it's even worse in a way, um, weirdly. But yeah, I'm, it's something I'm aware of. More question. No. I imagine it's supposed to be secret, but can you give us any exclusives about what you're working on now? It's <laughs> not a secret. It, my next thing isn't a secret. I'm doing, well, I'm doing two things, but in, in November I did a, a live class in February uh, with Iggy Pop, the, uh, uh, the singer, musician. Fully nude, four-hour live class in New York. And we're showing the, uh, the drawings from that in a museum. And we're doing a book uh, of the drawings that were made by this class of 22 artists of him naked. Uh, so that is a sort of a lifetime goal. I've had the idea for 10 years. And I asked him 10 years ago if he'd want to do it. And he said, he would, and, and he said no. And then I asked him last year and he said yes immediately. And I said to him, why, did you, why didn't you want to do it 10 years ago when he was 60? He said, I was too young to do it. <laughs> 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 he's, he's coming to a point in his career where I think he's going to stop performing, I think. And he wanted to sort of mark it with something that was totally different from what he's done before. And uh, much, you know, quite a brave thing, really, someone famous to be naked for four hours and be drawn in all different ways and quite unflattering ways as well by people you don't know. Are they professional artists or just a... Some are professional. Some are people who just started life drawing two weeks before and it was like their second life class. <laughs> <laughs> Lit literally, mm. literally. Mm. There's an eight-year-old lady who had no idea who she was drawing. <laughs> there were young people who were like going berserk because they were drawing him. They knew the day before, yeah. but some were like really high, high-end life class sort of experts, as I would call them. We've been mm. studying it for years. Others, people just started. But it's weird how some of the drawings of people who just started are actually better than the ones that people have been drawing. Did you draw them yourself? I didn't draw it, no. I didn't want to sink, you know, sink the level down to like... <laughs> I would have dragged it down to a terrible mm -hmm. moment. But I, I was just sitting in the corner just biting my nails because mm -hmm. I couldn't believe he was there, patiently sitting for three hours and holding a pose. I just couldn't believe it. And uh, he was very gracious. And, again, you know, it's a work about history. I mean, all this, is, all this works about history. And that, to me, is about a, a piece of rock history, living history. That body has been through, God knows what that body has done, <laughs> where it's been, who it's been with, what's been inside it, where it's been yeah. inside. You know, it's just had this, yeah. that body has lived. And, uh, and so is he, and he's still alive, which is kind of amazing. And I just thought we need to, sort of some, we need to document this body because it's actually a miracle almost of, uh, of music. <laughs> and and where, where are you showing this? It's going to be at the Brooklyn Museum yeah. in uh, November. Yeah. Might come to London after that. Mm -hmm. Fingers massively crossed. But all the drawings are given automatically to the museum in Brooklyn. That was part of the deal. I wanted mm -hmm. no of the, none of the drawings to appear on the market, to be shown in commercial galleries and sold and bought and all that. Mm -hmm. It's a gift to the American nation, as I see it, of these all these very important drawings of this incredible body, of this incredible mm -hmm. person. So it was, it's to do with the legacy and history of America almost. And, and I'm talking in massive terms, I know, but I, that's how I see it. So in a way, it goes back to the history of the world, which is a huge, ridiculous, overblown, pompous title for a drawing. But in a way, it's his, you know, his, his body is as important as anyone's body in America. Yeah. OK, um, we should probably stop now. Yes, um, thank you. So enormous thanks to Jeremy. Thank you. And, um, <laughs>